Just to let you know, this episode contains very strong language. Please be advised. Hi, Alice. Hey, Matt. Okay, should we just jump straight in because I'm on a tiny bit of a time crunch? Yeah, good. I'm all ready. You don't uh, have a script? Don't worry about that, mate. It's all up here. Right. Okay. Uh, Take it away. Okay. Episode two, Liz Truss. It's 1749. Uh, uh, I'll just stop you there. It's not, is it? No, you're right. 20-something. Details. Here we go. As the galleon approaches the Horn of Africa. Are you on the right story? Yeah, I mean, these things aren't the most important bits, so I'm just trying to paint a picture. Yeah, I don't know what picture. Um, Carry on. Mm -hmm. As a young boy, Liz Truss realised... I actually have to put my foot down because I don't feel like you've done any prep. Yeah, I, I, I think, what is it they say? Fail to prepare when you prepare to fail. So what does that mean? I think I failed. 14th of October, 2022, Washington, D.C. Quasi Quarteng flicks through his notes, trying to block out the hum of his aides around him. He pinches the bridge of his nose, squeezing his eyes shut. The last couple of days have been the worst of his life. He's in Washington to meet with the International Monetary Fund to discuss the impact of the pandemic on the markets. Pork or otherwise. But so far, all the IMF has done is tear into his mini-budget. Criticise him for crashing the pound. Even Joe Biden has expressed concerns over his lack of sound policy. But he's confident in his vision and he refuses to become an international laughingstock. He's hoping that his speech today will reassure the IMF and put their anxieties to bed once and for all. He can feel his aide hovering nearby. Quasi replies without looking up. This better be important. We've just got word from number 10. The PM wants you back in London immediately. The plane is waiting on standby. Quasi stops, looking up at her. Did she say why? His aide shifts uncomfortably glancing sideways at the rest of the team. They wouldn't say. He frantically pats his suit jacket, locating his phone. He calls Liz, but it rings out. So he goes to WhatsApp and types a quick message. Liz, call me back when you get this. Quasi's mind races. Liz has never been one to issue a demand from her office to him. He stands up, taking in the panicked expressions on his team's faces. What do you want to do, Chancellor? Nine and a half hours later, Quasi is in his car at Heathrow, speeding towards Downing Street. He tries to ring Liz again, but he still can't get through. He rubs his tired eyes. He spent most of the flight going over next month's fiscal statement, but now he wishes he'd slept. Oh, for God's sake, can you please put your phone on silent? His aide wordlessly hands him her phone. He looks down at it, confused then stares at the screen open-mouthed, his Twitter feeds going nuts. Turns out the whole of Britain has been tracking his flight while he's been in the air. A flash of confusion runs over his face. Why are they following him? Then he sees tweets from a Times journalist, and his blood runs cold. I'm told that Quasi Quartang is being sacked as Chancellor as Liz Truss prepares to reverse the mini-budget. A bead of sweat breaks out on his forehead. This can't be true. They're a partnership, best friends. They've spent months, years, building a new vision for Britain. As Quasi watches the motorway melt into the city streets, he feels everything he's worked towards slipping through his fingers. To be fired after 38 days would end his career in front bench politics forever. She wouldn't destroy their dream. Would she? From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So Alice, it feels like Liz Truss wasn't really around long enough for us to really get to know her. But what did you learn about her from the previous episode? Yeah, I've known guests who have appeared on this show for a 45-minute episode better than her. But even just from our discussion of her last time, you can see that she's got this 
unbelievable resilience, this thick skin, and maybe this misplaced ambition that just keeps her chugging along the track that she's chosen. If you think about the battles that we've already seen her wage, taking on the turnip Taliban, taking on, I think, one of my top five characters you've ever done, Sir Bag. Oh, thank you very much. It came disconcertingly naturally to me. Yes, I would agree. It's chilling. I suppose the other takeaway is just how crap it is to be a woman in politics. She sort of ticked the whole sexism bingo card, hasn't she? She's had to deal with smarmy men who think that she's there because of how she looks. She was up against the press who were labelling her a Cameron cutie. And she had constituents who were trying to block her election because she had an affair, which was patently hypocritical. Yes, it's not like that has stopped the rise of other Tory MPs in recent history. Please enjoy our season on Boris. Yes, but you're right. You really get a sense of that huge amount of personal drive she's got. And it's like she's on a collision course with people, even if they're her superiors. She's unwavering. And that approach has served her really well up until this point. Yes, exactly. And that doubling down and that sticking to her guns means that she's at the epicentre of that Tory win in 2010. So that's a huge moment for her. And in her mind, that's been a long time coming. Although in politics... 10 years to make that ascent, not that long at all. So what's she going to do next, Matt? I'll tell you exactly what she's going to do next, Alice. This is episode two, Hitting the Ground. Mike Williams set off on a hunting trip in a North Florida lake where it was thought he met his fate in the jaws of a vicious alligator. Except that's not what happened. And after the uncovering of a secret love affair, the truth would finally be revealed. Binge all episodes of Over My Dead Body, Gone Hunting, right now, ad-free on Wondery Plus. Ten years earlier, September 2012, Greenwich, London. Liz Truss sings at the top of her voice. Thank you, God. I want to dance with somebody. I want to feel the heat with somebody. Oh, my God, she's got an incredible voice. She can really sing. She has a similar outstanding range to you. Tonight, she's celebrating hard. A few hours ago, she and her friend Quasi Kwarteng held a press conference with a few other MPs. They've all co-written Britannia Unchained, their radical vision of a low-tax, low-spend Britain. She told the press the country needs shock therapy to get back to prosperity. But she also hopes she'll impress David Cameron with her radical views, make a name for herself in the party. She holds out her arms for Quasi to join her on the tiny stage. He pushes his way toward her, head and shoulders above everyone else. They both became MPs on the same day. They'd bonded over strong coffee and a mutual love of Margaret Thatcher. (laughs) Great. I mean, marriages have been built on less. You'd often wonder with couples, how do they find out they're into the same thing? It could be one of those very specific dating apps, you know, where it's like, do you like people in uniform? Do you like people who are very outdoorsy? Instead of (laughs) Match.com, (laughs) Thatch.com. Do you like strong coffee in a small state? (laughs) Like strong coffee, but hate the coal mining industry. (laughs) Liz grins, singing as loud as she can now to compete with his booming voice. Islands in the stream, that is what we are. No one in between, how can we be wrong? If somehow that has been smashed together and has made the final edit, I will be amazed. I think the thing that's smashed together is two cars as people listen to that on their drive to work. That was horrendous. (laughs) Oh, man. Next day, she sits in her tiny cramped office, nursing a hangover and scrolling through the reviews. Britannia unhinged. New Tory right called British workers laziest in the world. She flushes with anger. It's clear the reviewer hasn't even read the damn book. But then another email comes in. David Cameron wants to see her. Immediately. She grins. She's got his attention at last. When will we learn from the word immediately? Nobody is ever that eager to see you if the news is good. Call me now in block capitals. (laughs) Oh, this must be good. A few minutes later, she strides into the PM's office. But as soon as she enters... The smile freezes on her face. Cameron leans against his desk, arms folded. The chief whip, Mark Harper, sits in the corner of the room. Neither return her smile. Good vibes, okay, feeling great. I'm disappointed in you, Liz. 
This attack on British workers, you've put the party in a very bad light. She blinks at him, confused. And for the first time, Liz wonders if she's overstepped the mark. She stammers a response. Uh, Prime Minister, I can assure you that is the last thing I, I... But Cameron cuts in, holding a hand up to silence her. Please don't take me for a fool, Liz. You knew exactly what you were doing. Liz feels her cheeks flush with indignation. She may have played her hand too boldly, but she genuinely believes in the vision laid out in the book. Before she can stop herself, she blurts out a response. Prime Minister, we need growth as a party and as a country. And we can't get that without a radical shift in our policies. He shakes his head. I'm not disagreeing with you on that. The issue is how you've put it into action. You've given the press a stick to beat us with. Liz can see she may have gone about this the wrong way, but she also senses an opportunity. This is her chance to bring the Prime Minister on side. She collects herself, her mother's words ringing in her ears, to stick to her principles. Prime Minister, you know as well as I do that our party needs fresh ideas. To do that, we need to take risks. I know you feel the same. Liz straightens up, locking eyes with Cameron. I did this for the good of the party, for the good of the country. I stand by every word. Cameron studies her for a moment. Liz's heart feels like it might leap out of her chest. Then a smile twitches at the corner of his mouth. You're not the only one with principles, Liz. I just need you to be careful about how you express yours in the future, particularly if we work more closely together. Liz is taken aback. Work closely together? Her heartbeat quickens. Against my better judgment, I like you, Liz. You're different. I know you want to change this party, and we need a fresh approach like yours. Liz can't believe what she's hearing. Cameron smiles, holding out his hand. If you work with me, we can change the party from the inside. You can change the party from the inside. As Minister for Childcare, perhaps. She stares at him, open-mouthed, then darts across the room and shakes his hand. She's off the backbenches at last. Finally, a foot on the ladder. And she can't wait to start climbing. Four years later, July 2016, 10 Downing Street, London. <laughs> Theresa May slams her fist on the desk. She's only been Prime Minister for a few weeks. To be fair, in this story, that is worth celebrating. She's one of the longest-serving Prime Ministers <laughs> of the modern era. It's been a massive headache sorting Cameron's Brexit mess. And now Lord Foulkes, her Justice Minister, is outside waiting to complain about her new Lord Chancellor, Liz Truss. There's going to be a lot of time in this story to critique Liz Truss. I'm just feeling that in my, in my bones. But we should say it's a huge achievement to be the first female Lord Chancellor. And obviously that will be later overshadowed by future posts that she holds and the length that she holds those posts for. But not to be scoffed at. And Lord Chancellor is one of those posts that really sets you up to be maybe Home Secretary, Foreign Secretary. It's seen outside of the big four offices of state as one of the big gigs in government. She takes a deep breath, nods at her aide to let him in. Lord Fawkes marches confidently towards her, sitting down on the other side of her desk. She hunches forward as he launches into his tirade against Truss. The woman's a lightweight. She just spent the last three days choosing art for her walls. She purses her lips. I've already vetted her competency, thank you. But she could put the whole judiciary at risk. She isn't even a lawyer. Teresa snaps. Neither were the last two men who held the post. She glares at him. She respects folks, but she won't be dictated to. In truth, she needs allies, and Liz is loyal. A fighter. Theresa admires the way she holds her own against the opposition. And she's already proved helpful with Brexit negotiations. Fawkes stands up abruptly, a scowl etched across his face. Well, if she stays, I'll be forced to reconsider my own position. Theresa slumps back, 
plays with the large beads on her necklace. She doesn't want to lose Fawkes. He's been a level head, and she needs as many of those as she can get right now. She looks up as her Chancellor, Philip Hammond, strides in. At last, a trusted pair of hands. But Hammond's long, thin face looks even more pinched than usual. She gestures to him to sit, but he paces, agitated. Teresa, it's Liz. Teresa's heart sinks. What now? She's been on the phone all morning demanding an increase in prison budget. I just can't take it. She won't quit. Can you please call her off? Teresa leans back. Leave it with me. As Hammond turns to leave, she suppresses a smile. She's not going to tell him, but this is exactly what she needed to hear. Liz seems to be the only one around here willing to roll up her sleeves and get the job done, which can't be said of many of her male colleagues. She picks up her phone and calls Falks, tells him if he wants to resign, she'll be sad to see him go. But she's sticking to her guns. Her decision is final. Liz Truss stays. 4th of November 2016, Middle Temple, Central London. Liz gets to her feet, looks out at the rows of judges sitting on long oak tables in the Elizabethan banqueting hall. She steadies herself and projects her voice across the echoey hall. We can, as of today, fund an additional 2,500 prison officers. £104 million pounds is going into the prison service. I promised I would deliver, and I have. She grins, waits for the applause. But all she can hear are messages pinging on people's phones. She hesitates, then carries on with her speech. But as soon as it's over, she takes out her own phone and stares in horror at the mail headline above a photo of three judges in their gowns and wigs. Enemies of the people. Oh, God. It's been six months since the Brexit vote, and yesterday, a High Court ruling blocked Theresa May's move to start the process of leaving the EU. And now, the Mail is starting a campaign against the judges. I can't believe this was seven years ago. The horror show that has been the Brexit process means that I feel collectively we forget a lot of the twists and turns that have gone on. Definitely. But this was crucial because Theresa May wanted to just trigger Article 50, but the judges said, no, you need Parliament's consent. The government needs to go to Parliament and agree to trigger it. And obviously this isn't just about Brexit and the judiciary. This was the start, really, of a government that was prepared to attack many of our British institutions. And you saw Boris Johnson do it when he prorogued Parliament and the way he may have or may not have told the truth or otherwise to the Queen you were like, oh my God, we're living in a different era now where the government's prepared to go to war with a pillar of our constitution in a way that we'd never seen before. Liz mutters under her breath. Fuck. She looks up at the oak beam roof and feels her heart sink. The last thing she wants is to be stuck in a battle between the judiciary and Theresa May. A few judges are already at her table waving their phones. This is outrageous. It's an attack on judicial independence, and your bloody leader is letting it happen. Liz turns to escape, but is met with the puce face of a second judge. Oh my God, they're the duplicating. Throw us to the wolves, is that your plan, bloody Tories? She blinks rapidly. She's taken an oath as Lord Chancellor to defend the judge's independence. But criticising the male now means publicly defying the Prime Minister. She needs to buy time till she's figured out how to play it. I will deliver a full statement on this matter in due course. An hour later, she paces her office, surrounded by aides. Well, you've got two choices, both are shit. You either defend the judges and cross the Prime Minister, or you defend the Prime Minister and piss off the judges. Oh, it's a rotten mess, Matt. Do the right thing or do the wrong thing. God, it's a hard choice. <laughs> She looks into her empty coffee cup, feels her temples throb. She needs some fresh air, decides to step outside. 
In the cool night air, she watches the small pods of the London Eye rise and fall beyond the river. She knows she has to make a decision. She picks up her phone, her mind decided. Her political future relies on Theresa May, not the judiciary. She risks becoming a pariah in her own department, but it's a gamble she's prepared to take. She texts Theresa. I'm going to back you on this 100%. She's going to support her prime minister and toe the party line and just hope that her loyalty is rewarded. A year later, 10th of June 2017, Swaffham. Liz wanders through the huge tent on the village green. Today, she's judging Swaffham's best marrow competition. I would love to be a judge at an agricultural fair. I can see that. I can see you lording it up, walking amongst the carrots and the and the picker lilies. Oh, the pies, the marrows, the jams, the cheeses. Hovering and then saying, Madam, exquisite. I've never tasted a gooseberry like it. <laughs> You've made it sound like it's flirting. <laughs> the largest marrow I've ever seen. And I'm not talking about the marrow. It's the largest marrow I've ever seen. This is the cheese dancer. <laughs> but Liz's mind is elsewhere. Now we need focus for this. Two months ago, Theresa May called a snap election. And it's been an utter disaster. The government has lost its majority. 13 of her colleagues have lost their seats. The one silver lining is that a cabinet reshuffle looks imminent. And Liz hopes she's in line for a promotion. She tastes the last strawberry jam. She's just about to put a first prize sticker on an oversized marrow when her phone beeps. It's a message from the PM, inviting her to a meeting tomorrow at 8am. She beams with excitement. This is it. The opportunity she's always wanted. Next morning, she grins at Theresa May as she walks into her office. Liz, I'm so sorry. There's no easy way to say this. Liz hears the word treasury. Her mind scrambles to catch up. Her stomach flips. She's being... demoted. She concentrates hard on May's oversized chain necklace, breathes deeply. When May stops speaking, she manages to spit out. This is bullshit, Teresa. How dare you demote me after all I've done? I've been loyal to you. I don't want the few Tory MPs to increase my majority. But before she can fight her case, she feels a hand on her shoulder and she's politely guided out into the corridor. Oh, the indignity. A man stands in front of her, tells her she has forms to fill in. She starts her new post tomorrow. She grabs the form, scrunches it into a little ball and stamps on it hard. Moments later, she steps outside to be met with flashing bulbs and journalists jostling for position. Have you got the job you wanted, Liz? Liz, do you have any thoughts on the PM's dwindling support? Liz, did you really think that was the best marrow out of all of them? She thinks about walking over, telling them exactly what she thinks. That May is an uptight, backstabbing cow and not fit to govern. That she's made a calamitous mistake and that her days are numbered. OK, is there a way we can workshop that to make it sound, dare I say, a little more professional? Instead, she marches silently over to her car and slides into the back seat. Drive. Now. Fifteen minutes later, Liz is pacing up and down Westminster Bridge, desperate to clear her head. She feels humiliated. She's been loyal to Teresa, discredited herself in her own department for her, put up with countless tirades from judges. And for what? But the more she walks, the more she considers the new role. Maybe there's a way she can make this work in her favor. At the Treasury, she can find out firsthand exactly what each department does. Network hard, use it to her advantage. She decides. She'll take the job in the Treasury, but she'll do it her way. She won't ever Tow the party line again. From now on, she's a free spirit. And everyone's gonna know it. Casey Shane was murdered in the middle of an August night, shot point blank while idling in his Dodge pickup truck in North Indianapolis. 
There was no physical evidence, no known motive, and no one coming forward with information, except one woman who swears to this day she saw Leon Detroit Benson pull the trigger. Leon Benson was sentenced to 60 years in prison, all because one person swore they saw something. But what if she was wrong? And what if we could prove it? From Wondery and Campside Media comes season three of the hit podcast Suspect, co-hosted by me, Matt Scher, alongside attorney Lara Bazelon. This is a story of a botched police investigation, the dangers of shaky eyewitness testimony, and a community who feared law enforcement with good reason. Listen to Suspect, Five Shots in the Dark, wherever you get your podcasts, or binge all eight episodes ad-free on Wondery Plus. Find Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Two years later, 2019, Brooklyn Bridge, New York. Liz stands next to a metallic green mini. She puts one hand in the pocket of her red mid-length skirt and grins at the camera. She's been trade secretary for a few months now and she wants the best photo she can get for Instagram. I'm tempted to make a joke about her trying to get the perfect sunset shot, but this is actually quite important, isn't it? Because she was defined in a way by her social media presence. But however cringe we may find it, she did manage to harness it. Yeah, it massively raised her profile. I mean, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say it was part of what helped her become prime minister. She's just about to change pose when one of her aides comes running up. The meeting tomorrow with Boris, you're not on the list. She grabs the sheet from him, mutters under her breath. This is not fucking happening. She opens the door to the Mini and sits inside. Stares out at the Manhattan skyline. She rings Boris, but he doesn't answer. She rings again and again. She'd backed his leadership campaign a few months ago. He'd rewarded her with trade secretary. She spent most of her time touring the world, rubber stamping Brexit deals and building up her Instagram following. But this meeting's the big one. Trump will be there, and so will the world's press. She gets out of the static Mini and jumps into her ministerial car, barks at the driver. Take me to Hudson Yards. An hour and a half later, she steps into her brand new skyscraper, heads over to Boris, pushes through the crowd. I need to see your press pass, ma'am. She looks up at the guard, snaps. I'm not a bloody journalist. I'm the British Trade Secretary. She pushes past, watches Boris's eyes widen as she demands to know why he's excluded her from the meeting. He takes a step back. Well, I I haven't excluded you. It's just that you weren't invited. She folds her arms, smiles. An oversight. I'll expect a seat right next to you when I turn up this afternoon. She takes in his shocked face, spins on her heels and heads back to her aides. I'm in. I've sorted it. And none of you fuckers did anything. That is a direct quote. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It's how you talk to me sometimes, isn't it? Here. Sometimes you have to. Look, it's show business, not show friends, Matthew. (laughs) But didn't you work harder? Faster, stronger after that motivational speech. I did. I did. Cried more. Yeah, sure. But we can cut that out. Next day on the flight back to London, one of her team taps her on the shoulder, shows her a photo of her in the paper right next to Trump, as well as the latest party popularity poll. Congrats. You're second only to Boris. She grins, sips her wine. She looks through all the photos she's collected from her trade trips this month. Her in a red dress, staring straight at the camera on the Shibuya crossing. It had taken her an hour to get that, and she'd nearly been run over three times. Another of her in Sydney on a bike holding a Union Jack umbrella with the caption, Get on your bike and look for exports. She pauses for a second, then adds the hashtag, Straight out of Brompton. Oh, God. Brompton bike. I can't look. I can't look. If people listening have a moment to spare, they might want to go into the archive of Liz Truss' Instagram post because she's left them all up there. Lots to enjoy. Specifically, I would say focus on the hashtags. The one of her dressed as a devil? The one of her with Taylor Swift. 
Hashtag squad goals. Hashtag swift work. Hashtag trouble. I can't decide actually whether she's really good at this. I would argue not. Yeah, I, I defer to your expertise. I just think I like bad puns. Well, let's see if this post makes you decide either way. It's a picture of her at the Aston Martin factory. And she says, think we've sorted the casting for the new Bond movie. Hashtag license to trade. Hashtag view to a deal. Hashtag the name's trust. Liz Truss. A view to a deal isn't bad. <laughs> You're a very forgiving man. She grabs her coloured felt tip pens, unfolds her map of the world, and draws arrows from London to Tokyo, Sydney and New York. She'll add her photos when she gets back. Then she'll put the whole thing in the Conservative Home newsletter and show party members just what she's achieved. She leans back. Second in the polls is brilliant. She'll keep using Instagram and Twitter for all they're worth. Push her image as a go-getting, powerful leader. Boris may be the party favourite, but he's all bluff and no substance. He won't last. And when the time comes to replace him, she'll be there. A year later, May 2020, Greenwich, London. Liz switches on the television as she clears away her daughter's maths books. She's been homeschooling them both since lockdown started. She can't remember feeling so exhausted. Her eyes turn to the television as the bald head of Dominic Cummings appears. Liz turns the volume up, watches as he uses his moleskin diary to cut a path through the journalists crowding his doorstep. A few days ago, he was caught breaking lockdown rules. The screen cuts to a contrite-looking Boris. Well, I think he acted reasonably, legally, and with integrity and care. Liz can't understand Boris's loyalty. She hates Cummings. He calls her the human hand grenade. Right, say what you want about Dominic Cummings, but he has a way with nicknames, doesn't he? What was Boris? The trolley. The trolley, yeah, because it had a mind of its own and would just veer all over the place. Knowing what we know now, human hand grenade, kind of spot on. Liz switches off the television as her phone rings. Shit, it's Boris. She lets it ring through, only for Boris to try again a few minutes later. And then again. He must be rallying support and in real trouble. She doesn't care. He's slipping in the party polls, and standing up to him on this won't do her popularity any harm at all. An idea starts to plant itself in her head. Twenty minutes later, she sits a distance from Quasi on their favourite bench near the observatory. They've been neighbours since he moved to the same street a short while ago. They've been going for walks almost daily. This media furore over DC is becoming a real headache. I've just had Boris on the phone. Liz nods, but remains silent. She watches Quasi carefully. Quasi's always been loyal to Boris. He's the only Prime Minister who's ever given him a cabinet post. But I'm sure old Boris will somehow charm his way out of this damn mess. Do you really think so? Liz watches Quasi twist to face her on the bench. Boris did ask if I had spoken to you today. You missed his call. Liz trusts Quasi, but she suddenly feels unsure of her footing. Well, Boris won't last forever. I read in one paper that Sajid Javid might be considering a run. Liz looks at Quasi again, choosing her words carefully. Who would you like to see succeed Boris? He looks at her. You mean run against Boris? You? She nods. But the time is right, of course. And I'll make you Chancellor. He frowns at her, then looks away. She feels her stomach tighten, but she can't backtrack now. What do you think, Quasi? I'm serious. We've got a clear programme with Britannia Unchained. I've got a growing grassroots following, and you've got a brain the size of a small planet. OK. Flattery might get you somewhere. Quasi's booming laugh echoes across the park. Liz smiles, feeling herself relax. <laughs> I suppose it's not beyond the realms of possibility. Uh, do you really think we could pull this off? She gazes out over the London skyline for a few seconds. If anyone can, it's us. Are you in? He smiles at her. When do we start? Two years later, 
January 2022, Greenwich. Quasi closes the door to his elegant townhouse, fixes in his earbuds, and walks the few paces to Liz's house. Boris Johnson's government's on its knees. The police are investigating his lockdown parties. The Sue Gray report is due any day now, and the rumour is it won't be good news. The race is already on to replace him, and today, Quaz is determined to sound out what support there is in the party for Liz. He'll have to be subtle. It could backfire badly if word gets out he's canvassing while Boris is still in power. Is there any other way to do it other than in a kind of underhand Machiavellian way, unless you elect your successor? William Haig had this great quote about this, and he said, and forgive me for doing the impression, the Tory party is ferociously and passionately loyal to its leader until the point at which it's not. (laughs) So good. Quasi follows Liz into her kitchen, puts his moleskin notebook on the table. He takes out his phone and dials the first number on his list. Alistair Jack, Secretary of State for Scotland. He's always got on well with him in the past. If he plays it right, it'll be an easy yes for Liz. A few seconds later, he hears Jack's voice. Quasi, what can I do for you? He glances over at Liz. She's holding up a piece of paper with Is He With Rishi written on it. For a brief second, his mind goes blank. He hears himself blurt out. Are you a Rishi guy or a Liz guy? Oh, wow, yes, subtle, well done. He listens to the awkward silence on the other end of the line. Then hears Jack say, I'm a Boris guy, actually. And I should point out I'm in the car with the chief whip and you're on loudspeaker. Uh, uh, Oh, I don't like it. I don't like the cringe. I can't take it. No, I'm a Boris guy too. I meant... Who should we sack for disloyalty, right? Sorry, I think I've got the wrong number, dude. (laughs) It's been a while on British Scandal since my cringe glands have (laughs) swollen to quite this level. He looks over at Liz, alarmed, drops the phone. When he picks it up, he realises he's cut the call in panic. Fuck. He jumps to his feet, paces around the kitchen as Liz slams down her coffee cup. What the fuck, Quasi? He sits down, dials again. I'll sort it. Just give yourself a beat to decide what you're going to say. Don't ring back in a panic. Quasi. Alistair, um, I don't want you to think I actually meant any of that. It was a joke. Forget I said it. And I should point out that Liz isn't actually interested in running against Boris. (laughs) A genuine ache of despair. (laughs) He listens to the silence that goes on for an unbearably long time. I should hope not. Otherwise, it'll reflect very badly on her and those who support her. And I should add that the Chief Whip is nodding his head in agreement. Liz stares at him, then grabs her phone and furiously dials out. Alistair, sorry about that call from Quasi. I just want you to know he didn't ring on my behalf. In fact, I didn't know anything about it. What is going on? Stop ringing Alistair. (laughs) Alistair, switch your phone off. Everybody leave Alistair alone. Okay, let's all take a breath. Quasi looks at her, frowns. Think he bought it? No, of course not. She shrugs. He looks back at his list. At least he knows where the chief whip is now. I mean, that's very glass half full, isn't it? Liz is much better at this type of thing than he is. But he has to do this. Everyone will be sounding each other out. He'll just have to be careful not to make any more mistakes. He pushes up his glasses, looks at Liz. I say we carry on. In for a penny and all that. He watches her nod, then picks up his phone. Right. Who's next? 7th of July 2022. Bali. Liz holds up her empty wine glass for her private butler to fill, then lies back on the sun lounger. She's been at the G20 summit for a couple of days now, but this is her morning off, and she's determined to enjoy it. She closes her eyes, listens to the gently lapping waves, feels a light breeze on her face. She grabs her phone, hears Quasi's booming voice on the other end. Boris is stepping down. She sits bolt upright. 
You need to get back to London. Now! She jumps from the lounger, paces around the pool. She can't leave now. It's aqua aerobics. She's due to make a speech tomorrow, and she can't be the first to announce she's running. It's the kiss of death in party leadership races. She looks at her phone, scrolls through the messages from Quasi. Suella's running, so's Rishi and Tugendhat. You need to get back. She grabs the remote, switches on the TV to the BBC, watches excited news reporters outside number 10 talking through her rival's chances. She feels sick. She's been dreaming of this moment since she was a teenager. And now it's here, she's stuck in a bloody beach hut on the other side of the world. She throws the remote down, runs along the hot sand to the beach bar, shouts at her aides. Tell the plane crew I'm leaving in an hour. An hour later, Truss strides across the glimmering tarmac to her government jet. But as she marches up the stairs, she finds the door closed. She raps on it briskly, peering through the small porthole. But no one is inside. She yells over at her aides. Where the fuck are the crew? She watches them scatter in different directions, feels the 40 degree heat burning her skin, wipes the sweat from her forehead. 20 minutes later, one of her aides rushes back. Uh, the crew are on a mandatory rest. We can't leave for eight hours. Then there'll be a stopover in Dubai. She cuts in. When do we get back? The aide swallows hard. Uh, late Friday night? At the earliest. Liz screeches. Two fucking days! She paces near the jet, then decides. She can't waste time like this. She'll have to start her campaign now. She rings Quasi. Get Ian Duncan Smith on board and John Redwood and figure out how to stop Rishi. She might be stranded, but she's going to do everything she can to get things up and running. She'll call her donors, her supporters, and as many MPs as she can. She's not going down without a fight. Two days later, Greenwich, London. Liz folds her arms and watches two young aides turn over the hard, dry soil in her garden. Any minute now, she's going to film her campaign video and she needs her garden to look good. She's still jet-lagged from her flight back from Bali. She's hardly slept, but she can't waste any more time. She's already split the house into zones. A couple of hours ago, she told her aides... Put fundraising in the living room. Front bedroom's comms, the dining room's policy. Go. She checks her watch. The videographer is late. She heads into the kitchen, pours herself a coffee, and looks again at her laptop, at Rishi Sunak's slick campaign video. He's wearing an open neck shirt, and he smiles as he talks. Family is everything to me, but it was Britain that gave my family, and millions like them, the chance of a better future. She looks at his smart, ready for Rishi tagline. It's like something from a Superman poster. Calm down. She snaps the laptop shut, looks out into the garden and feels a knot in the pit of her stomach. He's been working on this for months. He's got big financial donors supporting him and high-profile members of the party. She's been ringing around for two days and she still doesn't have any money in her war chest. Right now, her only confirmed supporter is Quasi. A few minutes later, the videographer turns up. He looks about 12. He glances around nervously as she leads him out to the back garden. Have you done any leadership campaign videos before? Have you done any garden-based videos before? The young guy shakes his head. Nah, just weddings and the occasional bar mitzvah. She glares at her aides, but knows he will have to do. Liz brushes away invisible dandruff from the mutton shoulders of her mustard jacket and takes a breath to compose herself as she sees the red recording light flicker on. Three hours later, she sits at the kitchen table eating her banh mi as her aides crowd around and watch the video. She stares at the screen, horrified. The handheld camera keeps wobbling. It looks like a college montage. Do you remember this? Yeah, it gave me motion sickness watching it. It's terribly made. 
It's kind of what you'd imagine at the beginning, sort of slick stock footage, but then it cuts to her suburban garden and the guy filming it is just sort of swinging from side to side and she's desperately trying to stay in shot. That's what's so funny is aerial footage of London, of Britain. You're like, yeah, this is a country going places. And she's just sort of got something dead on a trellis behind her. It's like, no, this is, I don't know what you're trying to get across, but it, it's not working. She closes her eyes, orders everyone out, pours herself a glass of wine, then watches it again and again. With each replay, she starts to wonder if the handheld camera could play to her strengths. The video feels real, grounded. I mean, the last thing it feels is grounded. It's like she's <laughs> on a swing. <laughs> it even has a certain personality, charm. Yes, like if a child had made it, it would be charming. For winning over the grassroots, it's substance that matters, not slick image. She's going to keep it. She picks up her phone, calls Quasi. It's time to get on the offence and take the fight to Rishi. 25th of July, 2022. Victoria Hall, Stoke-on-Trent. Liz fiddles nervously with her gold necklace. She's waiting silently in the wings as the BBC presenter addresses the live audience. She turns as Rishi walks up beside her. He stares straight ahead, adjusting his open neck shirt. It's been a long battle. It felt like forever. It was the whole summer and there was no World Cup on. It was a nightmare. She can hardly believe they're the final two left in the race. She's edged ahead in the polls, but Rishi's still seen by many in the party as Boris's natural successor. Tonight, she needs to change that. She pastes on a grin and walks onto the stage. Watches as Rishi confidently waves at the audience. The press have been calling her wooden and robotic. But she's spent the last few days going over her content with Quasi and her delivery with her campaign team. Tonight, she's going to show the audience she's a woman of the people, in touch with their concerns and ready to deliver what they want. She stares straight ahead, silently goes through her sound bites as Rishi bangs on about being a safe pair of hands. She snaps too, realises he's attacking her. You've promised almost £40 billion of unfunded tax cuts. That's on our country's credit card for our children and grandchildren to pay. She blinks hard, tries to answer, but the audience break out into spontaneous applause. She watches him beam with delight. These cuts won't benefit the economy. And what's more, they're immoral. They'll disproportionately help the well-off. She feels a bead of sweat break out on her top lip. The lights suddenly feel low and oppressive. She grips the sides of the lectern. She has to do something fast. She throws open her arms wide and yells over the applause. Have you ever heard such defeatist talk in all your life? A camera zooms in on her. I want growth so we can all be richer. We need to take more risks as a country. Be bolder. But Rishi's shouting over her. You'll push people into poverty. Inflation will be out of control. Interest rates... She tries to argue back, but he's still yelling. The presenter steps in, holds up her hand. Let her finish. She hears herself talk about cutting bureaucracy. But as she looks out at the audience, she knows in her gut she's already lost them. She's almost back in London when she plucks up the courage to look at her phone. Oh, God, can you imagine? She stares at her Twitter feed, sits bolt upright. Rishi's been attacked for mansplaining, interrupting and yelling. Alice, that's when, um, like, a man will explain to a woman something that's obvious. I'm not sure if you've heard about that. No, thanks so much. That's really helpful. Post after post... <laughs> <laughs> post after post praises her for keeping her cool and mocks him. Next day, her hand trembles as she opens her laptop to look at the latest poll numbers. Her mouth falls open. She surged ahead. She's on 62% to his 38. She leans back and grins. They've got two more debates, but this war's all but won. 
Unless Rishi comes up with a miracle, he'll never catch her up. In six weeks' time, she'll be crowned the new Tory leader, the country's new prime minister. She'll make Quasi her chancellor. And together, they'll unleash their revolution. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the second episode in our series, Liz Truss. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read Out of the Blue by Harry Cole and James Heal and On Tour with Team Truss, an article for The Times. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. Karen Laws wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Our sound design is by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. This episode was produced by Millie Chu. Our associate producer is Francesca Gilardi Quadrio Corsio. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leloudis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn and Marshall Lewick for Wondery. <laughs>